You want to get started in film photography? Let's talk about that. A lot of people these days are interested in film photography. And it's probably for a variety of reasons. Some people want to be able to create the kind of images that you can only create with film. Some people want to just be a part of that history and that, that uh, understand that process. Let's take a look at some of the uh, cameras and the film formats and let's see what you need to get started. Now obviously the first thing we're going to need to get started with film photography is going to be a film camera. And, there, and there's a lot of different kinds. But let's, let's talk about first a couple of different film formats. The most common film format is going to be 35 millimeter. Now this is uh, a 35 millimeter film cassette and you can see the leader sticking out here. Um, this is 35 millimeters, probably the most common kind of film you're going to find. There's a, a zillion cameras uh, made for 35 millimeter. The image size is, on the negative is 24 by 36 millimeters, which happens to be the same size as a full frame sensor and a full frame digital camera. Uh, in fact, that term full frame probably comes from the size of the frame from a film camera. The um, Film, the 35 millimeter film is available in a wide range of emulsions or film types from black and white uh, negative film, color negative film, and color positive film, which is or slide film. And so there's a lot of films to choose from. 35 millimeter is actually a, probably a pretty good place to start because it's just so available. The other kind of film that you'll see are for medium format cameras. Now the most common medium format film is 120 roll film. This is kind of an old roll, but um, these have a plastic spool. Some You might find some old film still that's on metal spools, but plastic spools. The film is actually overwrapped with paper, and the paper has numbers labeled on it depending on the actual image size that you're using. Um, some cameras, you actually have a little window you open to see what frame you're on. So the negative or the film size on these is six centimeters wide, the film is. And then depending on the length of the negative that you're shooting, in, in each camera has its own format, um, will determine what size image you're shooting. So um, there are cameras that make a six by four and a half centimeter uh, image. And those are, you'll hear referred to as 645 type cameras. Um, there's a lot of cameras that shoot what's called a uh, square negative. So it's six by six centimeter. You'll also hear that referred to as two and a quarter square. Because two and a quarter inches is about the same as six centimeters, roughly. Um, so there's a lot of cameras that shoot a uh, six centimeter square negative. There are cameras, like some of these folding cameras, that shoot a much wider negative. This one actually makes a six by nine centimeter negative. And there are some that make six by seven centimeter. And, and this is one of those cameras that has a little window that you actually open up and you can see what number you're on on the roll of film. Whereas other cameras, when you load the camera uh, and wind it, they automatically stop after they've advanced the film the correct amount. So there's a, there's a wide range of cameras for medium format shooting the same film, but with different size images. And um, obviously the wider the images on the film, the fewer images you get on a roll. And so a 645 camera, I believe will give you 15 or 16 images on a roll. Uh, two and a quarter square or six by six centimeter will give you 12. Uh, a camera like this that shoots a six by nine centimeter negative will only give you eight. So uh, two and a quarter is kind of to 35 millimeter what full frame is to crop sensor cameras today. So, you know, the bigger film, the bigger negative size, the better image quality you're gonna get. So, uh, the two and a quarter or medium format cameras uh, are very popular these days um, because of the uh, image quality. Now, if we're wanting to start with 35 millimeter, there are a lot of 35 millimeter film cameras. From little simple plastic point and shoot cameras to uh, rangefinder cameras, um, this is an old Canon L2 that uh, rangefinder cameras have a viewfinder you look through and there's two little windows here 
and what you see is uh, an image, you know, when you look through the viewfinder, but it'll have in the center a little rectangle that'll have either a blue or amber moving image. Uh, so as you focus, there's two images that are superimposed, and when you line the two images up, then you're in focus. And while that seems a little odd, uh, it's actually very fast. The Leica rangefinder cameras are known for um, you know, quick to focus, quick to use. And so rangefinder focusing is still very popular. Um, rangefinder cameras, then this, like I say, this is an old Canon. There's Leicas, there's, uh, and these have interchangeable lenses. There are a whole range of uh, rangefinder, range of rangefinder cameras that have um, fixed lenses with leaf shutters built in made by Yashica and Olympus and Minolta and Konica. There was just a ton of them and you kind of have to watch those leaf shutter uh, rangefinder cameras if, if the shutters have gotten sticky in them or whatever. A lot of times you'll find a used one that they have to be cleaned and lubed before they work. There are also folding rangefinder cameras like this is a little Kodak Retina 2A. These were made in Germany uh, for Kodak and these have great optics. Again you see there's two little windows and one you look through you have that superimposed image a little focus knob here that you uh, use to focus with. Now this does not have interchangeable lenses but very good optics and it's nice and compact and you, know, you can put that in a pocket. It's 35 millimeter and they're just great little cameras. So there's a, there's a wide range. Now the next and I won't say step up but probably um, more common camera is your 35 millimeter SLR. Now through the 60s and 70s, the 35 millimeter SLR was the king of 35 millimeter. They're called an SLR because they're a single lens reflex, kind of like where a DSLR came along, which is a digital single lens reflex. Uh, they have interchangeable lenses, and um, you can obviously you can put zoom lenses on them. You can put all kinds of different prime lenses, just like your digital camera. Um, one of the nice things about buying one of these kind of cameras is that if you shoot mirrorless cameras the lenses that go on your film camera can be adapted to your digital cameras too so they kind of get dual use that way these are um, very easy to operate they uh, they're quick and easy to load film into they have built-in light meters and um, so they're very fast and very easy to use uh, if you're used to shooting a DSLR or a mirrorless camera with an you know, electronic viewfinder you're going to find these a very quick and easy transition. Now you have to manually focus and you in some cases have to set the controls manually. This Nikon FM uh, is all manual. You have to manually set a shutter speed and manually set the aperture. Um, but there is a light meter when you look through the viewfinder so you can see when you've set it correctly. There are also more modern um, and, and this is actually a very inexpensive um, SLR from Canon but as as the um, film era kind of was getting close to its end um, a lot of manufacturers were coming out with electronic 35 millimeter SLRs that had autofocus they had all kinds of auto exposure features they they were very similar to what you might feel like you have with your digital camera with the exception that they don't shoot video obviously but all the um, you know, common aperture priority, shutter priority, program, automation, through the lens, flash metering, all that kind of really fancy stuff, they were available here. And and like I say, these were autofocus. And so like your digital camera, all the controls are set in the camera. You set the shutter speed, the aperture, everything in the camera. Really all you're doing with the lens is just zooming and the focus is automatic, autofocus. So some may find a camera like this a bit more familiar if you're used to shooting digital, um, these are actually probably less expensive than these kind of cameras are these days, um, to some degree, because a lot of film people just want that experience of shooting everything manual, and so they haven't really migrated to these. But um, a lot of these are available. This is a Canon EOS Elan 2E, whatever that means. And I think if you look these up on eBay, you'd find them extraordinarily inexpensive. So, um, there are 35 millimeter SLRs that have a lot of automation and um, in a lot of ways probably don't seem that dissimilar uh, than your digital camera. So, 
35 millimeter again you can start with rangefinder camera you know there are slrs uh, there's folding cameras there's point and shoot cameras uh, some of the little 35 millimeter film point and shoot cameras are you know pretty automatic but for most people i think probably a 35 millimeter slr is a great way to go and if you stick with a brand like nikon canon minolta olympus um, I'm sure I'm leaving something up. Pentax, you know, these were all just beautifully made solid cameras that um, will just uh, serve you very well. So that's kind of 35 millimeter. Let's now move on to medium format. Okay. And I think as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of different medium format cameras as well. There are SLRs um, in medium format. There are twin lens cameras. There are rangefinder cameras, kind of like in 35 millimeter, as well as um, folding uh, viewfinder cameras in medium format. Now, I don't own a um, medium format SLR, and it's just a personal preference thing for me. There's some really beautiful 35 millimeter or medium format SLRs available out there. Uh, Hasselblad's, Mamiya RB and RZ67s, the Mamiya and Pentax and contacts 645s um and I'm, I'm sure i'm leaving some out if you have a favorite it, it's just those type of cameras have never just had as much appeal to me personally um i find them kind of clunky they do have a you know like an slr your you know dslr or your 35 millimeter slr they have a little mirror that flips up you know when you take an image but on a medium format camera it's a big mirror and so they 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 um can be a bit loud and clunky as far as i'm concerned so it just they never really for the type of photography i do they just never have had that much appeal um one of the more um less noisy lightweight whatever uh, medium format cameras that's still very popular are twin lens reflex now this is an old yashica 635 originally this had i don't have the adapter but it had an adapter that you could load 35 millimeter film in this too that's why the model number is 635 it could shoot six centimeter film or 35 millimeter film. So um, these have a viewfinder that you can open up and you're actually looking through the top lens. So there's a mirror in here. When you look through, you know, hold this down and look through it, you're actually looking through the top lens. When you take a picture though, you're actually taking a picture through the bottom lens. Now, if you get kind of close to your subject, there's some parallax. Uh, you have to deal with and and some cameras actually have indicators in the viewfinder that show you um, you know where that parallax error is um, these were made by Minolta by Yashica Yashicas are probably the most prolific uh, Rolly or Rolly Flex twin lens cameras you'll see Rolly Flex and Rolly Cord twin lens cameras were made in Germany they're just beautifully made um, unfortunately they're also a little bit more expensive than maybe the Yashikas. Uh, the Minolta Autocord, if you can find one, is a, just an amazing camera with great optics. Um, the Yashikas are, are also good. This 635 actually has a very simple three element triplet lens, which amazingly performs quite well if you stop it down a little bit. Um, the Yashika, Yashika Mat or Yashika Mat cameras, the Yashika Mat 124, um, or the, just the original Yashica mat would have a four element tester type prescription lens a little bit better. Um, but these are fairly readily available, not too terribly expensive, and can produce just uh, really amazing image quality. These um, twin lens cameras are not very heavy. They're relatively lightweight. They're easy to load. The film goes in the back and you load it and you notice the film is gonna make a right angle. You're gonna put your roll a film in here and then run it up over the top and to the take up spool um, some of these have the little window on the back where you have to wind it till you see the number and some of them like this one you put the film in and just start winding and it'll stop you when it gets to the right place and so they're um, they're very easy to use um, this one is kind of all manual you have to manually cock the shutter when you take a picture some of them have cranks and you crank the film to wind it and it automatically cocks the shutter Mamiya made a range of twin lens cameras, the C3, the C33, the C330, and there's a C2 and a C220, or 222 and then a 220. And they have interchangeable lenses, so you can get wide angle and normal and telephoto lenses. Um, they are 
quite a bit heavier, though. They're really beautiful cameras, and they take great images, but they're professional cameras made. I mean, you can handhold it, but it, they're heavy, so um, they probably live a little bit more happily on a tripod. One of the things I really like in medium format cameras are folding cameras. Now, I, I've kind of got a thing for German folding cameras. This, this is a little um, Zeiss Icon um, two and a quarter square folding camera. It, it shoots a um, 120 film, but it's a two and a quarter square, as you can see here. These are, are called a Zeiss Netar, N-E-T-T-A-R. They're fairly inexpensive, usually less than $100 online. Um, they have a very simple three element lens. You have to uh, estimate your focus. You can get little accessory range finders that you put on these to um, tell you where to focus. They kind of have a limited range of shutter speeds. This one has uh, a, well, has bulb and then a 25th, a 75th, or a 200th of a second. So it's kind of a limited range of shutter speeds, but the image quality from these things is um, really surprisingly good. The nice thing is they're very compact. You know, you can put it in a coat pocket or whatever, and they take really great images. Now, there are folding 120 cameras that have range finders. There are even Fuji made some more modern ones that uh, have great optics, um, more sophisticated, um, but they're obviously a lot more expensive. So, but these are, are quite available and and um, quite affordable. This is a Zeiss Icon Iconta, and same kind of deal but it's it shoots a six by nine centimeter we looked at this earlier a six by nine centimeter negative uh, or you could put transparency film in it but I shoot black and white negative film in it mostly but it's a big negative almost approaching medium format in size it's it's a really big negative now the Icontas have a full range of shutter speeds from one second up to a 250th of a second and again you have that uh, focus where you have to kind of guesstimate your focus or, or use a, an accessory range finder. Has a little viewfinder on top. Um, these are really just beautifully made. It's, it's, I have kind of a thing for German folding cameras, but these were just beautifully made. They're very precision um, for their time. And you think about something like this being made. This was made just right after World War II and still in just beautiful shape. And uh, with that big of a negative, it takes just amazing pictures really great I have some of these from both Zeiss and from um, a company called Voigtlander so uh, really amazing medium format cameras so there's a wide range of medium format cameras kind of like 35 millimeter they are SLRs there are rangefinder cameras uh, Fuji like I said made some rangefinder medium format cameras one of them looks like a um, kind of like a big you know, like one of these kind of cameras, they, they call it a Texas Leica. It looks like a big Leica rangefinder camera. But it's, um, they shot six by nine centimeter film. Fuji also made some 645 and, and Mamiya even made some two and a quarter square and six by seven rangefinder um, medium format cameras. There are some older cameras like these that you can get that are um, much less expensive. So, you know, typically a camera like this is gonna cost a hundred dollars or less. Uh, if you get one like a Super Iconta with a range finder, there'll be quite a bit more, you know, money. But um, if medium format, you know, if you're if you're wanting to shoot landscape type of work or uh, something, you know, scenic, those kind of things, these kind of cameras, you know, work great for that, and they're not expensive. So that, those are some cameras that um, you can get a hold of pretty pretty easily. Um, next, let's talk about how to do that. How do we find these cameras? So where do we find a film camera? Well, film cameras were made for a long time. So and there's, you know, a zillion of them out there. So it's, you know, I find them at thrift stores, flea markets, yard sales, garage sales, as well as online auctions. And there's some retailers that still sell used film cameras. Um, if you're wanting some place to buy one that's uh, reputable and you know you can trust the equipment that you're buying, probably one of the online retailers. Um, I've I've been doing business with one cam camera company uh, since back in the film days. It's KEH Camera Company. Um, they have an online store, and uh, even recently I've purchased equipment from them. And they just have a, a really good reputation for you know 
actually their descriptions of their cameras the cameras end up usually being better than what they describe so i've had good success with them also recently i've purchased some uh, camera equipment from robert's camera I've had good success with them um, again neither of those are any kind of official endorsement um, they're not paying me to say that i've just had good experience with those two retailers and so i trust them um, I, you know, I buy these at a lot of different places, but I, I know how to work on them a bit. So if they have an issue, then that doesn't really worry me too much. Um, but let's say you find a 35 millimeter SLR, maybe it's at a yard sale or something, and you want to know that it, at least it works, right? So, you know, you should be able to, um, on a manual camera, be able to wind and fire the camera. You'll see the shutter open and close like that and you can actually hear the kind of a buzz as the shutter runs and the aperture in the lens should open and close now I just was firing that at f1.4 if I stop this down to let's say f8 now you should see a smaller hole when that fires so it um, you know, the aperture blade should open and close freely. The shutter should run. If it runs at the slow speeds, typically you're okay. You know, the faster speeds will probably be all right. Um, you want to look and see if light seals have deteriorated and gotten um, either are crumbling or gotten gooey and sticky. And also on a 35 millimeter SLR, there'll be a foam strip at the top where the mirror uh, stops. And if that foam strip up at the top inside where the lens is, in the lens opening if that has gotten crumbly or gooey and sticky it might need to be replaced those are actually both repairs you can do at home they're not hard to do you can buy neoprene foam weather stripping and use some scissors and cut it out and clean the old off and use some alcohol and then you know replace it with the new the the one inside the lens is a little bit more sensitive because the focusing screen is is real close to it so you have to be careful but you know those are things that uh, a lot of people you know learn to do on their own if you're not sure you could take it to a camera repair person and and um, they could probably help you with that without too much expense if that's all it needs so a mechanical camera you can usually wind fire listen to it and test it and and verify that it's working obviously a test roll is the real way to go now some uh, electronic film cameras like that Canon I showed you earlier have to have batteries to run and if, if the batteries are dead, then you may not be able to test it. But again, if the price is really low and uh, the camera physically looks like it's in good shape, it might be worth trying out. So those are some places you can find these. Like I say, I've bought a lot of cameras over the years and uh, from online auctions and from online retailers, there's a lot of other sources. The thing that's important if you're buying online is to look for reviews, not only for the equipment, but look for reviews for your seller to make sure that the seller has a good reputation for not only, you know, describing uh, camera equipment accurately, but also if there's a problem with taking a return or handling a problem. So, you know, just like anything you purchase online, you have to be careful. But in a lot of cases, you'll be able to find these locally and actually handle them and try them before you buy them. Like I say, at a lot of places, thrift stores, yard sales, etc. So that's, that's some of the places you can find these. And, uh, Hopefully you'll be able to find one that's to your liking and get started. Now, I've gotten a camera, bought some film, went out and shot it, now what do I do? Well, you need to have your film processed. If, if you're not set up to process film at home, then you're going to want to find a, a film lab that can help you. Now, most major metropolitan areas have multiple film labs that are running these days. There's a, any number of them that you can find online. Um, you want to find a film lab that has a good reputation, of course. If you can find a local film lab, they're a great resource for advice on, you know, the film you shoot. So if you, you know, shoot some film and they process it and maybe the exposures weren't quite right or whatever, a good film lab will be able to give you some advice on how to improve your uh, process to get better exposures. So a good film lab is a great way to start. Once you've kind of gotten your feet wet with film, you may want to think about processing your own film. And with black and white, certainly, that's not too difficult to do. 
Uh, I don't use a full dark room anymore. I, don't, I mean, I have enlargers and all that other dark room stuff in storage. Someday I may drag it out. Right now, what I typically do is I'll process the film. And again, for me, it's black and white. And then I use one of my digital cameras to scan the film and turn it into digital files. So my dark room these days is a computer. But um, the images start with film. So black and white film processing is relatively easy. The, the equipment is, you know, some... If you're shooting roll film, then you've got some reels and tanks that the film um, can be processed in, and then you've got to buy the chemicals. The chemicals, again, aren't too hard to find. Um, Freestyle Photographic is a good resource. B&H Photo, Amazon, um, all the, you know, they're readily available. So, and there's a lot of, of, of lot of information to learn about processing film and darkroom work. We're not going to try to dive into that today, but. For most people getting started, the best first step is to identify a local film lab that you can work with that can process your film and give you advice. And even, you know, if you have some images that you actually want printed from the film, um, that lab should be able to make you prints from your film. So find a, find a good photo lab. That's probably the best place to get started and have them help you um, get your film processed. Well, that's about it. Get yourself a film camera. Get some film, find a local lab that can help you process it, and you'll be on your way. Don't be afraid to make some mistakes. The film's not so expensive that that's really an issue. And uh, I think you'll have a lot of fun with it. Well, thanks for joining me today. I uh, always appreciate it when you watch my videos. If you would, please click the like and subscribe buttons. And um, look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Thanks for watching.